Hello, I'm Shane in Sweden, and in this series of presentations, we're looking at the OWASP Top 10 Threat List from 2017. In each of our presentations, we will look at one particular threat, we'll describe the problem, and give specific C sharp examples of the threat in practice. We will then perhaps look at mitigations and safeguards we can use when we're developing in C sharp to reduce the risks from this threat. In this three part presentation, we're going to look at number eight on the list of top 10 OWASP threats. And this list item is called insecure deserialization. In the first part, we're going to look at what serialization is, where it came from, and also why insecure deserialization became a problem because insecure deserialization was not originally in the old OWASP top 10 threat lists. In the second video, we'll be going through some C-sharp code examples that illustrate the insecure deserialization problem. And in the final video, we will be examining ways to handle this threat mitigations we can use as part of our secure development lifecycle. So welcome, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so here we have the uh, OWASP top 10 threat list from 2017. And if we go down into the table of contents, we can see that at number eight, we have a new threat here, which is called insecure deserialization. Look at the threat. We can see that it is difficult to exploit. It's quite common and it is somewhat detectable. Interesting though, it says the impact of deserialization flaws cannot be un understated. One of the problems here is that the flaws can sometimes lead to remote code execution, which is a, a very, very serious threat indeed. And the business impact really depends on the actual application itself. Before we go into any more detail of the threat, I think we should actually look at what serialization and deserialization is, never mind uh, whether it's insecure and, and where it came from. So we'll have a look at the uh, background and description of what serialization and deserialization is next. So what is serialization? Where did it come from? Why is serialization important to software development? And what, what do we use it for? Well, serialization has been around for quite a while now. It actually turned up an early form of it in the 1980s, where the Xerox Corporation, who invented many diverse computer technologies that we use today, such as the graphic user interface, the mouse, laser printers, and also an early form of serialization with their network systems courier technology, which was used for remote procedure calls. But serialization and its complement, deserialization, was found to be very useful and it's used these days for much more than just remote procedure calls. Although it still is used for remote procedure calls. What does uh, Wikipedia say? Well, Wikipedia says serialization is the process of translating data structures or object state into a format that can be stored and or transmitted and reconstructed later. And that format can be binary or it can be text such as XML or JSON. If we give an example uh, of serialization and deserialization, we can we'll think about the teleportation transporter in Star Trek. We can think about this device as a serializer, deserializer. Captain Kirk is an object that steps into the transporter chamber, which is our serializing motor. The object is then serialized into a stream of data, which I think in Star Trek used to call energy patterns. And that energy pattern is, or stream of data is transmitted or beamed to the target transporter machine where the captain is deserialized back into matter, the original object. So you can see the basics. We convert the object to a stream of something like byte, bytes or text, and then we transmit that stream over the wire or we store it somewhere. At the other end, we receive the stream, consume it or read it from the store, and we deserialize it to recreate the original object. As an alternative to the term serialization and deserialization, you'll hear people use marshalling or unmarshalling. It means the same thing. Okay, so we mentioned that serialization has uh, quite a few uses. So let's look quickly at some of those. As we said earlier, it can be used as a method for transferring uh, data over the wire, a form of messaging. It can be used as, as a method of storing data easily into a database or a hard drive, some method of persisting our data. As in the original use, it can be used in remote procedure calls. 
And then there's some more obscure reasons why you might want to use serialization and deserialization, such as distributing objects. And also it's actually a fairly effective method for detecting changes in data. And I may actually do a small video on how you can use serialization and deserialization to detect data changes along with hashing methods, because it can be quite effective. But you can see there's a number of reasons, but the first two is really the, uh, the, the, the major use of serialization and deserialization today. So we've got this useful method. What really is the problem? Well, the problem is that a number of researchers, this is just some of the people here involved, started to discover really quite serious flaws in particularly deserialization. And in Java, problems discovered originally, I think, in the Java Spring Framework, which eventually became a vulnerability, reported vulnerability. Here you can see it says, this vulnerability shows that the deserialization of objects from untrusted sources and this is a fairly important point, allows remote attackers to bypass intended security restrictions and execute untrusted code. So this is remote code execution, RCE, which is one of the fairly serious types of attack you can, you can see. And this was way back in 2011, this was reported. However, despite these early warnings, it took until 2015 with the discovery of a deserialization exploit uh, which was detected in the Apache comments, that interest in researchers in this type of security flaw was really triggered. And suddenly the hunt was on for gadgets. Uh, gadgets is the name they refer to as abusable bits of code that you can use to generate uh, remote code ex execution exploits. And the researchers, once they started looking, they found these gadgets everywhere. They found them in web application servers, continuous build automation servers, network management systems, all using these uh, Apache comments. And the flaws were so prevalent that this started to be referred to as the Java deserialization apocalypse. But um, what happened in real life? Were there actually any attacks uh, using these flaws? And you're probably not going to be terribly surprised if I tell you that the answer is, of course, yes. Last year, Equifax was hacked um, and they lost records consumer credit records and personal data on about 150 million American citizens, about half of the country. And this hack is now believed to have been carried out through a deserialization flaw, through a chain of gadgets. Uh, do you remember earlier when we looked at the description of the insecure deserialization threat uh, on the OWASP list? Right? Uh, you may have noticed that OWASP doesn't give much guidance on the business impact, since it says uh, the business impact depends on the protection needs of the application and data. Well, here we have an example, a practical example of the business impact. For Equifax, it's not that difficult to assess the business impact since uh, Equifax is a publicly traded company. And we can see that the, uh, the effect on Equifax after the breach was actually quite significant and certainly affected their share price considerably. So this type of threat is not to be underestimated. Right, well, we know now that researchers had discovered problems with the Java deserialization. Um, and of course, the next question it's reasonable to ask is, is it something that just affects Java? Because we know a serialization as a technology it is very popular today. It's not used just in Java. It's used in Objective-C. There's direct support for it in these languages. Uh, PHP, for example, Ruby, uh, Python, and of course, C Sharp. So at this point, it might be useful if we can go look and see what OWASP says uh, about these problems and the languages and, and what can we do about deserialization. Well, OWASP has actually a deserialization cheat sheet uh, with guidance. And if we look at what OWASP says about it, well, they have guidance on deserialization and how to keep your object safe. And it has, uh, here we've got tips and tricks, guides on what you'd be doing for PHP, what you should be doing for Python, and what you should be doing for Java. But actually, there is nothing here for us C Sharp users, except, of course, they have um, some generic help, for, which is applicable for all languages. And we'll look at this, amongst other things, in more detail in the third part video of this video series, where we're going to look at mitigations. But you can see there's no real direct help for C -sharp .net users here under OWASP, which is something we'll have to fix quite soon. Because if you're looking at this, you might 
think, well, actually, there is no problem in C Sharp or .NET that we're actually, we have avoided this deserialization apocalypse problem. And unfortunately, that is not the case. Even as far back as 2012, James Forshaw, a security researcher, gave a presentation at Black Hat USA on safety issues involving .NET serialization. And he gave some uh, really good examples, in fact, actually, of, of where it could possibly go wrong. And this led to an actual Microsoft security bulletin, uh, where you can see vulnerabilities in the .NET framework could allow remote code execution, published in 2012. It involved a security update to actually try to resolve uh, reported vulnerabilities. And you can see that this security update addresses the vulnerabilities by correcting the manner in which the .NET framework serialization process handles trusted and untrusted data. So Microsoft were quick to respond to James Forshaw's work at detection of the serialization problems in .NET. Although as Forshaw himself reported, they were, Microsoft were not able to fix everything. In some cases, they were only able to provide mitigations. So it wasn't a complete solution. But because Microsoft came out quickly with that uh, update, Things were, I guess, in the .NET world, considered uh, okay for a while. In 2017, uh, researchers Manoz and Mirosh gave demonstrations at the DEF CON and Black Hat conferences where they were able to demonstrate gadgets that they had discovered in .NET. I have included a link uh, to their presentation. You can find it under this video, and it's a great presentation, and I thoroughly recommend that you read it. So we know that the problem exists in .NET as well. And the question is, what do we do about it? In the next video, we will run through some code examples demonstrating the attacks that Manoz and Mirosh discussed at DEF CON. So you can have a better idea of how these things actually happen in practice. And then in the third part of our video series, we'll examine how we can protect ourselves against this type of vulnerability. So that's the introduction to serialization and the history of the problems with it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you in the next video.